Welcome along to today's edition of the program. And if you're watching here on YouTube, then do make sure to like today's video and subscribe to the channel to get more conversations between brilliant people from all walks of life. Uh, uh, talk about some of the most interesting subjects that you can imagine. And today on the show, we're asking, can the Bible make sense of the modern world? Today, I'm joined by Andrew Ollerton and Tom Holland. Andrew Ollerton is the author of the recently published book, The Bible, A Story That Makes Sense of Life. And in it, he makes the case for why the Bible story has spoken to multiple generations and why it still is, in his opinion, the best guide to life today. Tom Holland is the author of books including Dominion, The Making of the Western Mind, and most recently has edited a collection of essays on Jesus titled Revolutionary. Who was Jesus? Why does he still matter? And Tom, along with other guests, including N.T. Wright, will be speaking at our forthcoming Unbelievable Conference in just a couple of weeks' time, Saturday the 15th of May. The theme very much ties in with today's show, actually. Uh, we're calling the theme of the conference How to Tell the Greatest Story Ever Told can find out more at unbelievable.live. But today, Tom and Andrew having a very friendly discussion on their different experiences of the Bible, how its story has shaped our culture and whether it can still shape culture in an increasingly post-Christian age. So Andrew and Tom, welcome along to today's show. Um, we'll start with yourself, Andrew, uh, as, as someone who hasn't been with me on the show before. Um, tell us a little bit about your background. I know that you are the author of a, a course as well on the Bible. Uh, and this book very much is, is complementary to that, isn't it? It is. Yeah, thanks, Justin. It's great to be on the show um, today. Glad you framed it as a friendly conversation with uh, Tom, <laughs> who I greatly uh, respect as well, his work. Yeah, the, the book is, um, it is a compliment to the Bible course. I think it, it's doing something a bit different. The Bible course was really designed to help people see how the different books and characters in the Bible fit together. Um, the book does some of that, but I think the real uh, thrust of it is, you know, is the Bible coherent? But even more importantly, is it still relevant? And I think, well, the reason that that matters, I think, is because culturally, perhaps previously, we were more concerned with is the Bible reliable? And I think the conversation shifted. I think more and more people would almost shrug their shoulders and say, well, even if you can prove that it's reliable, uh, why would I bother with it? There's plenty of other things to watch on Netflix. Uh, what, why is it still relevant? What's the relevance? So, you know, the book in that sense is coherence and relevance. And so what I try to do is move through the arc of the biblical narrative from the origin story in Genesis right through to the sort of hope scenes in the end of Revelation. But to tag to each of those major biblical episodes, uh, a, a human condition, a, a felt need, something demonstrating effectively that the Bible still throughout its story uh, speaks to our story, its relevance um, for today. So that was what I, uh, what I took on. Um, and, uh, and that's the book in its, in its essence. Yeah, it's interesting you say the conversation has changed in that way. I think I would agree entirely. And it's interesting to see that there are a lot of contemporary, quite secular thinkers like Jordan Peterson suddenly looking at the Bible, not particularly asking, can I, you know, is it literally true, but saying, is it useful? You know, is can it speak to today's culture? So I, th I think you're tapping in on something that seems to have emerged a bit recently in our culture. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think, you know, somebody like Jordan Peterson, you know, picking up on the Bible, at least as an archetypal narrative, you know, something that profoundly makes sense of who we are, almost, uh, you know, not wanting to engage really in, in the particular questions around is it, is it actually true does it map on to historical events but simply recognizing almost regardless of that it's profoundly useful and i think a deep concern and we'll probably pick up on this but a deep concern around what happens when we ditch that narrative what what else have we got in the locker that can safeguard human flourishing and society and I, and so i think you're right there's there's um, even people you know would refer to themselves as christian atheists right that you know they're, they're not necessarily believing in a metaphysical god mm -hmm. but uh really seeing the value of christianity and and I really respect that. I think, um, you know, I wrote the book partly with, as an invitation to those who are really not persuaded by the metaphysical commitments of Christianity. And one of the things I say early on, and I sort of drew this from Charles Taylor, who has this nice line about, you know, almost needing a new kind of apologetics that says, you know, just try it on for size, you know, see if it fits and, and makes sense of you. And I quite like that idea. And so I wanted to write something that was pretty accessible for popular culture and something you could just say, mm you know, you don't have to sign up to the Bible to give it a try, see if it fits and makes sense of you. Great stuff. Well, really looking forward to the conversation today with 
Tom Holland, who's our other guest. Tom, um, you've had a chance to read and indeed endorse Andrew's book. So, so what did you make of it? Presumably it was a, a good endorsement because I think it, it even made the cover of, of the book. Yes, absolutely. Well, I, I, I wouldn't give an endorsement if I didn't like it. <laughs> and I, and if I gave a negative endorsement, I'm sure it wouldn't appear on the cover. So, um, <laughs> yes, I think you can take the thread that I read it very much. What was your overall kind of takeaway from the book when you read it? What, did you find it, you know, yourself helpful in terms of putting things together in a way I don't know uh, or certainly I suppose for people who aren't so familiar with the Bible I guess there's a lot of people who who just don't have in a sense and I'm talking about Christians here as much as anyone a real sense of the way it all hangs together and the way it has been accessed in by generations past so I, I guess you you think whether you're Christian or not it's important to to understand that Tom. Well, one of the things that um, that I've learnt to appreciate and enjoy since um, uh, writing about the history of Christianity and kind of immersing myself in it is to look at the Bible not just as um, source material for uh, what may or may not have happened um, over the periods that the, the Bible describes, but also to um, really to read it as a holy text, which is something that I hadn't been doing since um, childhood. And so um, Andrew's guide to the Bible from a believer's point of view is one that is kind of very accessible and not in any way reductive, (laughs) which I often find that quite a lot of of Christian commentaries on the Bible overtly can be quite reductive, aimed at the general order I mean, this kind of slight Sunday school teacher quality to it. And Andrew's absolutely does not have that. Um, so, so I enjoyed that very much. I was going to say, obviously, it'll be interesting to come into that in the conversation, you know, how you do approach the Bible now, how your recent experiences and the way you've been engaging with the Christian story has, has sort of shaped the way you, you now perceive and, and take on scripture. Talk to us briefly, though, about your own recent book. I'm holding it up for the camera here as well. Um, this is Revolutionary. Who was Jesus? Why does he still matter? This was actually a collection of essays and you sort of formed the introduction to them. Give us give a sense of what this one was about, Tom. Well, as the title um, implies, it's it's about Jesus as the fountainhead of revolution, which, I, again, I was very happy to put my name to. I didn't choose the people who contributed to the um to the book but I was very very happy to see the range that they had so obviously there are believing Christians um, there are Christians from the left there are Christians from the right Christians from various denominations there's also uh, Jewish Muslim intellectuals writing about it um, and there are uh, agnostics and atheists so um, I think the, the range of voices in that book is tribute to the core argument that um the figure of Jesus, whether whether you are talking about him as um, the son of God, as someone who actually lived or simply as a literary figure is of seismic importance in the way that um, the history of the world has evolved over the past 2000 years. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I love the way you begin your your introductory uh, piece to it, where you start talking about the uh, his coming was foretold by prophecy, his birth heralded by miracles only narrowly did he escape a massacre of the innocents, so on and so forth. All sounds like it's leading up to Jesus. Of course, it's actually Augustus Caesar. Um, and you make the point very I know. well that, that, <laughs> that you, you lead us on. <laughs> you. I have to confess, uh, you, had, you, you had me there, Tom. I have to confess, when I read it, I was taken in hook, line and sinker on that. I thought, uh, it was brilliant. But the point being, in a way, that, that um, you know, there were these messianic divine almost figures, you know, but the point you make in, in your introduction is but none of them really changed the status quo in the way that this particular figure did, Jesus. Um, and, and in that sense, do, do you see the Bible itself as having that kind of a an import? I mean, in as much as that yeah. has been the, the medium by which we have seen that revolution take place. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the Bible is easily the most influential book that's ever been written and not least is it influential in the in the way that it, it kind of establishes the idea that that a book can have that weight and that status so the idea that um scripture properly is scripture that it offers a guide to the purposes of god and a way to live um in a single package is is not a, it, remotely a given and in fact it takes 
um, Christians and Jews a fair amount of time to arrive at a kind of sense of of what we would call the Bible, because to begin with, ta biblia, it's, it's plural, it's a collection of books. And so that idea we have now of the Bible as the good book is in itself a kind of massive statement about just how revolutionary and seismic the influence of the Bible is. Um, and in a sense, I think certainly in the West, but you could also, you know, the, the I think that the, the way that Muslims regard the Quran, I mean, in a sense, the heft that, that, that Muslims give to the Quran is even greater than Christians give to the Bible. Yeah. But that sense of scripture is something that um, Jews, Christians and Muslims all have. And that idea of it begins with, uh, really, I mean, really what Christians call the Old Testament. I mean, that, that kind of sense of Hebrew scripture as it has emerged and evolved. And it's it's the process of change over the course of, of, of the years isn't just in terms of the texts, isn't just what people have decided as canonical, but how they have understood those canons, the very principle of a canon. Um, and so, so I think that... Um, you know, the very basis of, of the conversation we're having today, the idea that, well, well, this book has been the foundation of an entire civilization. It may be less so now. Does that matter? I mean, it, it, that in itself is the measure of how colossally influential what we call now the Bible has been. Yeah. I mean, in terms of the way you've your understanding of the Bible has developed, Andrew, I'm guessing you perhaps were raised in some kind of Christian context, but... Um, has your own appreciation, I suppose, of the Bible and the way it has shaped our culture uh, changed in that time that you've been engaging with it as as a Christian? Well, you'd hope so, wouldn't you? Because I, I was uh, I was brought up on the Bible, you know, in the sense that my parents read it to me, and I, I hope my um, my understanding is slightly more nuanced now than it was then. But I, I think you know it is a journey with the Bible. It's it's um, it's not it's not a, an obvious and easy. Uh, thing to to grapple with. I, I, it's precisely one of the reasons I love it. Actually, is that it it gives you something to wrestle with. I, I often, I've often described my journey with the Bible like that experience of Jacob, you know, re- finding this encounter and wrestling, but coming out at times a bit more broken, but hopefully a lot more blessed through it as well. And I think that's that's been my journey. I know when I was in my teenage years, I sort of took a, I swerved away from um, the faith that my parents, you know, confessed. Um, I didn't get into anything too serious. I got sent home from a Christian camp for bad behavior. That was about as bad as it got. But uh, I, I do remember in my um, teenage years, the late teens, com- sort of coming back to a position of faith now for the first time, owning it and beginning to read the Bible. And, um, and you know, that was piecemeal, I think. I still had a, a, an approach to the Bible that assumed it was largely some statements that I should learn and, and some moral tales that I should know. And then I had a conversation actually with someone on, I put, put this in the book, but I had a conversation with somebody on a beach where I was talking about the Bible and he was, he was very skeptical about it. And I can't remember how I got into this conversation. I think it was about 18. And, um, and he said to me, well, have you read it? And I sort of paused and he sort of pressed me and said, you know, have you read all of it? And I had to acknowledge that I, I hadn't. Um, and he said, well, how do you know it's not full of contradictions then? And so I sort of went away chastened and, and, began to read the Bible, uh, whether I'd recommend this to others or not, from cover to cover. And I have to say that was, that was a real turning point because for the first time I grasped, firstly, how knotty and complex the Bible is. I think I just not, not understood some of that. But I also grasped something of, well, this is actually a coherent narrative. As Tom says, there's, there's a deliberate reason why the two Testaments were brought under one cover. It was a deep conviction that the two Testaments nevertheless narrate one larger story and uh, so I've kind of grown into that really and to some degree made that now something that I have you know both written about and, and spoken about uh, quite widely but you know you, you then go through university don't you and then you fake I did a geography degree first and then a theology degree and then theology doctorate and you do you do that kind of experience and of course in a secular western context you you face all kinds of challenges to the convictions that you have and I think that refines them and revises them but Largely, I feel um, my confidence in the coherence of the Bible is is uh, stronger. Hmm. What, what's been your change in relationship with the Bible? I suppose, especially in the last few years, Tom. Um, I, I mean, do you still tend to kind of approach it essentially as a, a historical document? Or you said you're reading it more as a sacred text now. I mean, in a personal way or what, what, what does that look like? Well, that was the great change for me was that... Um, before I came to write Dominion, 
I was looking at, as I said, as as a collection of historical sources. So if I was writing about, I don't know, the, the Persians, I would look at, at Isaiah as a source for how how the Judean exiles viewed Cyrus and Persian rule, or indeed the book of Job as a kind of source for how they were refracting their understanding of the Persian court and things like that. Um, when I um, when I came to write Dominion, I realised, of course, I've got to, to try and understand the Bible as the people that I'm writing about understood it. And that required me to essentially shift the gear so that, that I, I was not looking at the Bible as a collection of texts that had evolved in response to specific historical circumstances and had come to have kind of meaning imposed on them by subsequent generations that perhaps hadn't originally been intended. Instead, I had to view it as a kind of enormous anthology of poetry, all of which joined together. And there, there were two particular moments that kind of recalibrated it for me. And um, the first, I think, and the most significant was um, looking at Paul's letters and realising that Paul's understanding of what was going on with the crucifixion and the resurrection and the unexpected fact that the Messiah had turned out to be crucified had been the fruit of Paul going through the scriptures that he was intimately familiar with and drawing this conclusion. So that in a sense, the, the founding theological texts for Christianity derived from as far as we can tell, because Paul is the earliest source, the surviving source that we have, you know, that, that it's witness to the way in which the very earliest Christians were looking at Jewish scripture and saying, OK, what does this tell us? And that that was crucial for me because up until that point, I'd kind of thought, well, you know, the, the Christian scripture, the New Testament is a misunderstanding of the Old Testament. It must be because they're back projecting assumptions onto onto these scriptures that can't that can't exist there but to realize that in a sense the the building blocks of christian theology came from the close reading of uh, of 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 what comes to be called the old testament by christians really kind of opened my mind to the the relationship mm. between the two bodies of text the relationship between old and new and kind of affirmed for me how fundamentally joined they were and that if i was going to understand the christian bible i had to I had to read it in that light. I had to look for Jesus in the Old Testament as well as in the New. Um, the second was writing about Origen, the great church father in third century Alexandria, who's by far my favourite um, of the church fathers. And he talks about the entirety of scripture. Um, and he, he says he's quoting a, 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 his Jewish teacher. Um, who says that the whole of scripture is like an enormous mansion with many rooms and the keys are scattered around this mansion in different places. So you have to go through all the mansion to find the keys and then find them to, to match them with the uh, with the correct lock. And I kind of love that as a kind of almost Borgesian metaphor, this idea that the Bible maps onto I suppose the, the the entirety of the cosmos that that it's tra it's transforming the whole of the cosmos into a collection of texts, a collection of books, and yet that there are keys and that you can turn them and go into into new rooms and discover new things, and of course that understanding of the Bible is has been so influential over the course of the centuries, um, and is one that I think has been profoundly neglected both by um, a lot of the most kind of um, foghorn-wielding Christians, um, the kind of fundamentalists, the people who say there is a definite solid answer, it tells us this, it's absolute, you've got to take it literally. And of course, by atheists, who in a sense are, are, are you know, other side of the same coin, sure. also assuming that this is what the Bible is. And to get back to that kind of the, the rich metaphoric quality that you get, not just in Origin, but in all the church fathers, was... I found it incredibly liberating. I, I'm sure that's music to your ears, Andrew. In in that sense, do you, do, I, I suppose you could only hope that other people would have a similar journey to Tom of of coming to appreciate the coherence of this, as you say. What what kind of for you though are the kind of the big sort of takeaways that you would want people to to know from your book of of the way that the Bible stacks together and and what people often miss when they're just looking at the kind of I don't know, just trying to sort of work out 
did this happen? Did that happen? What what view of the is is the bigger picture we should be looking at here? Well, I think. Uh, it- in part, it's simply an acknowledgement that the Bible is seeking, at least, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a claim and you can contest it, but it is seeking to tell a meta-narrative, a grand narrative. And that this narrative um, told through this, the, the Christian scriptures, the Old and the New Testaments, that in some way it, it's a universal narrative. I think that's one of the take-homes. I think so often we people pigeonhole the Bible as a religious text for those who um, are already, you know, committed, but actually the, the whole story is framed on the universal scale, isn't it? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It sounds like the beginning of a story and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an all-encompassing narrative. And so I've often compared the Bible, as others have, to an hourglass. That's the shape of the story. It begins with the widest angle, tells an origin story. Then it does funnel down into a more particular story, um, in particular, through the, Abra- through the Abraham covenant, this nation of Israel emerging. But even as the story narrows down into that nation, God's purpose is being expressed for all of creation. You know, Abraham was promised in, in you and through your descendants, all families on earth will be blessed. So even as it goes local, there's still something of a kind of gl- what we would call a global vision to it, which I think is remarkable. Um, to have that written into a story so early on and that theme plays out so what you've got is this tension of a creative tension in in the old testament of israel's god being the creator god so there is monotheism there is one god and yet he's elected he's chosen this particular nation and i think that tension is is crucial to understanding the old testament but what it does mean is that god in that sense is has made a covenant with a particular people and when that people are oppressed then in Egypt, uh, in slavery, under the boot of the superpower of the day, um, it's part of the narrative that God is a God who r- brings freedom for those who are oppressed and sides with those who are marginalized against the powerful. I think that's written right in to the Old Testament narrative. And, and salvation ultimately is Exodus uh, when it comes to the Bible. It's that narrative of liberation. And so, you, in other words, the, the hourglass, you do funnel down, and ultimately it funnels right down to one particular point of this Jesus of Nazareth, right? The whole of the story, from a Christian perspective, funnels down to a moment where uh, the hopes of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, are resting on the shoulders of this Messiah figure. And his death seems to bring that to an end, and his resurrection brings it to a new beginning. And and then from that, hence the hourglass, the whole story then opens back out again as, as, the, um, as the hope of, and, the, and the salvation of, of the Messiah is offered to all nations. And then you finish the, the Bible, the narrative completes. You know, it's got a beginning, a middle and an end. And at the center of the middle in terms of significance is the center of gravity of the whole story, um, Jesus Christ. But the ending then glimpses scenes that Christians believe lie ahead of us. You know, there is this future hope of a new creation of resurrection and and it and it's a brilliantly hopeful climax to a story that um is very honest about the suffering and pain and tragedy of life in the real world so i suppose you know if you're going to take anything away from um from from the as a headline it's that the bible is a a universal story with a messianic center but also that it's real um that is to say it's and this has always been one of the things that i i've been surprised by as I engage with the Bible is that it doesn't hide from the gritty realities of life. Uh, it's not neatly airbrushed out some things that sometimes when we read it, even as Christians, you, you almost wish that wasn't there. <laughs> but uh, it, it's so it's very real. And the characters in the story are very flawed. And for me, that that is crucial to the account because written into the very beginning in the origins in the origin story is this idea of a fall what what christian theologians have called a fall a descent from how we were intended to be to how we now live and so the characters in the story are not the heroes that you might expect they've not been written up um it, as, Tom, as did I, you want to I come did. in yeah i because i was just wondering um andrew's description of, of of the bible being full of flawed characters um I mean, there has been a sense right from at least the second century AD that among those flawed characters is the God of the Old Testament, which is why Marcion, the 
the first person we know who who tries to construct a canon basically just gets rid of it. Um, and th there's always been a kind of a, a slight tension there, I think, throughout Christian history, um, a kind of Marcionite trend to say that actually um, there's quite a lot in the Old Testament that is embarrassing and that the behaviour of God in the Old Testament is a source of embarrassment. And I, I mean, I don't know whether you two would, would, would agree with this, but I have a sense looking at, at the, the contemporary churches, all of them, um, that there is a kind of Marcionite cringe in all of them that they are nervous there is there is very little engagement with the god who smites the amalekites or smites the israelites for having a census or any of that kind of stuff so i just wondered you know do you do, do you yeah. do you think that that's a fair observation I'll, i'm going to get andrew to respond to that after we go to a quick break um and i'm sorry to cut in on it because that's a, a fascinating question but uh, i'll leave us hanging there and we'll come back with andrew uh, my guest today asking can the bible make sense of the modern world are andrew ollerton and tom holland andrew author of the recently published book the bible a story that makes sense of life uh, tom a multi-published author but uh, going to be speaking at this year's unbelievable conference as well so we'll be back in just a moment's time for more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter. Welcome back to the second part of today's show. We're asking, can the Bible make sense of the modern world? Uh, Andrew Ollerton, author of the new book, The Bible, A Story That Makes Sense of Life, is talking about why he believes the, the story of the Bible, the sweep of scripture, does speak to generations past and today's generation. But but can we, you know, say that the Bible, although it shaped previous generations, could shape the world going forward? Uh, that's what we're talking about with Tom Holland as well on the show today. Uh, as I've mentioned, Tom will be with us for Unbelievable, the conference in just a couple of weeks time, where we're very much talking around these issues as well with people like N.T. Wright and others. Unbelievable.live to book your place on Saturday, the 15th of May. Um, I had to leave us on a cliffhanger there. Um, Essentially, Tom asking you, Andrew, um, yes, the Bible's full of imperfect characters. Is one of them God? And I, other churches are a bit ashamed of some bits of the Bible. And like it or not, we all act a bit like Marcion and tend to sweep those embarrassing bits under the carpet and don't really dust them off, you know, in our services very much. So, yeah, what's your thoughts on, on all of that? Well, I think my first answer, my first answer is yes, I do think that the uh, to the second question uh, the, is yes, I do think the church has has a tendency to become Marcionite, partly because I think it's hard enough uh, today in a secular context to communicate something of what the Bible's about. And understandably, there's a sort of rush to go to the if you've got a very short bandwidth, let's go straight to the center and talk about Jesus because he seems the easiest and most important to communicate. So some of it may just be pure uh, attention span, how, how difficult it is to help people understand the Old Testament, do we need to go there? But I do think also, you know, if you're going to tear into the Bible, the Old Testament is often the, the place to, to go. And, and yet, I, I think when it comes to, to Tom's first point, you know, is, is God one of the bad characters? I mean, I think ultimately, or flawed, plenty, flawed. or flawed characters. Okay, we'll go with flawed, yeah. <laughs> Um, I think firstly, you know, I've been helped by the principle that I think, you know, Calvin and others lent on, which is sort of a sense of divine accommodation, that there is a sense in which at times in the Old Testament, what we're, what we're understanding is a God who is working through imperfect circumstances to bring about his purpose. And at times, like, for example, the conquest of the promised land, you know, that involves some use of force. And, and that's difficult. I, I, have, I haven't got easy answers to that. But I think divine accommodation a sense of god using the uh, working within the cultures and the uh, the periods in which the bible is written it's a story rooted in real if it's a story rooted in real history then it's going to involve some of those if you like necessary actions that we that, that are part of the the process but i also think that um in addition to divine accommodation i also think that what you're seeing with the bible and hence the two testaments is two different covenants and Part of what's changing in the Bible, you know, either you fundamentally believe that God is changing in the Bible, which is in a sense where Marcion arrived. You know, there's, there's two different kinds of deity or at least uh, the one deity's had some kind of conversion <laughs> and the New Testament is now God as a Christian. Uh, so either God is changing um, or the, the covenant is changing. And I think some of what, uh, we, what we're seeing in the shift is 
this new covenant made in the blood of the Messiah that means how we relate to God is fundamentally altered. Um, so I'm not saying that's a com- comprehensive answer, but I think it gives part of the answer to why they seem so different on a, on a surface reading. Could I, another question, which, um, again, I, I very rarely, and this may be just my lack of, of listening attentively to sermons, but um, that thing I mentioned about Paul going through scripture and finding Jesus in scripture, now, there, there are obvious places where you so, so at Christmas, um, the reading of Isaiah and the suffering servant and, and, and Beth, the prophecy of Bethlehem and all that kind of thing um, is 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 part of it. But is Jesus. I mean, is, is Jesus the voice in the burning bush? Is he to be thought of that? Is he is he. Is it the Trinity that turns up to Abraham? Are there, is that the angels? Is is Jacob wrestling with Jesus? Should we be. Should Christians be framing the, the 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 Trinity in that in those terms? Is Jesus present to the, it, within the narratives of the Old Testament? Well, I mean, I think my answer is is that if the back to what I was saying earlier, if the Bible is one coherent story with one God uh, from creation to new creation. Then, and if Jesus Christ is to be identified with that God, then God's actions in the Old Testament, in some way, are uh, have a coherence with um, the person of Jesus Christ as He is then made known in the New Testament. So, you know, are there pre-incarnate appearances of Jesus? Is the angel of the Lord, you know, a pre-incarnate appear- appearance of Jesus? I can understand. You know, at times it seems like Jacob thinks that he's wrestled with God and you know, well, then what is that? And so it's not Jesus of Nazareth, right? But it, it, there is a sense in which a pre-incarnate manifestation, I mean, you know, a theophany, a, a sort of manifesting of God's presence. Now, I think that, that said, you know, I think you often see this with, you see this in the Reformation playing out, don't you, that Luther and Calvin were very opposed to each other on how they, how much of Christ, if you like, they read back into the Old Testament. And I think there can be this kind of hide and seek game that, that, that's played that's really unhelpful. But I think that so many, and I think, you know, N.T. Wright's been really helpful for me here. So many of the symbols and stories of the Old Testament, symbols from Sabbath to temple and stories from, you know, David and Goliath right through to the exile period. So many of these stories find their fulfillment in Jesus. And what I think you do see with the New Testament writers is that a little bit like a sort of film where there's a big reveal at the end, maybe a murder mystery or something. Once you've once you've seen the big reveal at the end, you can't help but run back through the entire plot and realise, oh, of course, that's that was that clue. Or that. So I think there is a legitimate reading that says, actually, we read the Bible backwards and forwards, and Jesus makes sense of the Old Testament as much as the New. Um, yeah. Yeah. Tom, did you? Did you? I mean, where, where's that question coming from? I suppose is, and, and I suppose my question for you is. Um, at this point, obviously, Andrew is dealing the, with the Bible both as a historical source, but also obviously as a believer, as someone who believes there's a God whose hand has divinely conspired to bring this together. Whatever you think about the, the specific historical elements of it, it's a God ordained thing. This thing we call the Bible and the story of Jesus and the way it all maps onto each other. Is that somewhere where you're willing to go? I mean, is and that's a very personal question in a sense is that kind of something that you're kind of are open to at this point that there's it's more than just in that sense a historical document well that that's the mindset that i had to adopt yeah. when i was you know everything i had to i had to engage with what the bible is for the people that i was writing and and and, and studying um and I had to stop thinking about it just as a, a kind of compilation of, of, of texts. And I had to let the, um, the the power of it, I had to be open to the power of it in that sense. And so in a set, I guess, I guess in a way that, you know, th- these are the questions that, that it provides. I'm not asking this, uh, you know, as a historian or anything. I'm asking because these were a lot of the thoughts that came to me as I was reading it and thinking, well, you know, I have questions. <laughs> <laughs> not as not as not as someone kind of uh, you know looking at them as I, I might a kind of you know dissected frog on a, a table or something to mm. probe it but because you know reading it I guess with with a kind of in an origin spirit saying you know okay so if it's a huge room where the keys are 
then then this is an obvious, you know, these are the questions that I have. How does it all join together? Um, and I guess that there's 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 a, you know, I talked about Marcionism as, as it, it's a kind of anti-Semitic perspective that the the god of the old testament isn't good enough for the god of the old you know to be the god of the new testament but i think there is also a kind of a, a reverse a kind of desire not to culturally appropriate scriptures that are perhaps specific to jews um and i think that that also may be a, a, a inhibiting factor for christians who are aware of the kind of the legacy of anti-semitism within christianity mm. um about <laughs> well actually you know your scriptures they're all christian um so i don't know whether you think that that's that that's an issue as well certainly that has been for me tom i would say i think i mean firstly I, I think you're right to to note that there are real dangers in detaching the the old testament from the new testament in terms of what becomes unaccountable i suppose that the narrative framework of the entire scriptures that it is the God of Israel who has revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ is vital. Um, and and that, you know, uh, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, there are specific purposes that only make sense, uh, particularly unpacked in Romans, that only make sense uh, that Paul has in mind when those two are thoroughly integrated. But I also think for me personally, um, having been taught uh, biblical Hebrew by, you know, a Jewish rabbi, I remember just finding that a very refreshing experience for me to think about how to sensitively read the Hebrew scriptures in the light as a Christian in a way that did justice to this person's faith and commitment whilst not diminishing my own. And so I do think that there's a... Did, did you discuss this with the rabbi, the different ways that Christians and Jews look at, at, at the, the, the Hebrew scriptures? Yeah, I think particularly when it comes, as you say, to, to um, Trinitarian readings, that's that was one area we discussed. And I think also, you know, I, I had found the suffering servant um, in, in Isaiah, those those uh, suffering servant songs, a very um, significant part of my journey to a conviction that the the scriptures had an integrated cohesion. That, that was one of the Isaiah 53, especially one of the scriptures. And so had quite a long discussion around alternative views on as opposed to just presuming that that definitively proved that a, a Messiah would suffer, which was not the, the expectation of the day. So certainly we had those conversations. I don't think, um, you know, and, and I don't think it's, I wouldn't be saying the text is so obvious, you know, you, you can't reach any other conclusion as a think as a thoughtful person. But, but I have come, and I, I think this is where it, it is slightly nebulous to say this, but I have just come to a place of, of peace that actually, when you do what you've done, Tom, which is to almost say, well, suspending my own personal convictions, let me read this text as though it is an integrated and sacred uh, whole. When you take that kind of canonical reading, it's been my experience that it just coheres. It has sense and meaning. Now, I know that that could be unpicked, but that's a personal experience. Well, and no, I, I, I completely agree. It's, it's, I mean, I to read it with the sense that it has this power that it that, mm. that, that it's you know, it's it's imbued with clues and meanings and um, that that point to the entire explanation of the cosmos. I mean that obviously makes the book incredibly more interesting to read. Mm. Of mm. course it does, um, because because you know what 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 could possibly be more more thrilling than that? Uh, mm. And and that's why I say that I think the. Um, that kind of Borgesian sense, you know, the, the the idea that a library can perhaps contain the entire universe, or the entire universe can be contained within a library, um, it's such a kind of remarkable fantasy. And yet, to realise that Borges was drawing on that for on the writings of the Church Fathers, and the Church Fathers literally believed this, and and you know, they writers of such sophistication and power and scholarship, um, you know, why not? read it in that light um it it essentially it's the only text that someone from my cultural background could could do that you know i i can't look at the aeneid and kind of you know choose bits at random and think that the gods are genuinely <laughs> giving me a guide to the future but culturally i can read the bible and i can open myself up to the possibility that this is more than just an assemblage of texts from specific periods 
But I can imagine that the sceptic coming back immediately to that, Tom, and saying, well, of course you can, because the Bible has shaped the world you live in, as, as you so well, you know, have established in your own work. So are you simply reading yourself back into a text that has shaped you and it's a sort of vicious circle in that sense? And if you had been raised, I don't know, in Arabia, then the Quran would somehow magically explain the world to you in a, yes, in a remarkably course. coherent way. I, yes, I mean, so so, um, I mean, uh, so essentially, I have to I have to um, let off the safety lock <laughs> because, of course, <laughs> I ha- I do have all kinds of questions about how these texts came to be compiled. I know that there are all kinds of various versions. I know, you know, I know I've read all the biblical criticism, and I, 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 and I know that it's immeasurably complicated, far too complicated for me from my amateur perspective, possibly to engage with. But um, I, I'm also aware that that in a sense, to worry about that is to position myself within a particular cultural framework, a particular temporal framework. And that there are other periods of history where I've looked at this book, where there have been very different perspectives. And I am not so confident now that the perspective of the 21st century is necessarily correct. I think it's one of multiple Mm. perspectives. And I I guess it's kind of about avoiding the enormous condescension of posterity. It's about going back and looking at what, you know, the the, the reformers in the 16th century or the the great um, theologians of the Middle Ages or the church fathers or, you know, or Paul said about scripture and recognizing that um, if if I kind of... um, if I open my my mind to them and and kind of lie back, tune in, you know, don't worry. Then there are there are there are truths and understandings and perspectives. And definitely, um, as Andrew said, it makes the biblical texts much more interesting. Yes, I suppose the same question for you then, Andrew. Why why this text? Why this story? Why, in a sense, you were raised in it. You were raised in a culture that was, you know founded on the, the judeo-christian thinking uh but today you know you, you I, I know there's a popular podcast called harry potter and the sacred text literally the presenters sit down and treat the harry potter books by jk rowling like the bible and say we're going to read from the epistle of whatever and and draw out spiritual life lessons and to that extent you know i can imagine the person who says it's useful but it's useful because uh, it, it's it, it's appropriate to you. The person who gets a lot of Harry Potter or the Quran or the Bhagavad Vita or whatever, that's just the way we do life. We get our narratives, our meanings from whatever our culture hands to us as, as being most meaningful. Is that all the Bible is then just another option? I'm, I know you're going to say no, but, but why, why not in your opinion? <laughs> well, I think it, you know, I'd agree with Tom uh, in terms of what he said earlier, that actually, um, of course, that is culturally conditioned. I'm not trying to stand outside my own context and upbringing. But I, what I would say, in addition to that, is I think, I mean, when it comes to Harry Potter, uh, you, arguably, you can see Christian the Christian story playing itself out even within that story. So is there an archetypal story? You know, is there something that is underpinning all other great tales, uh, whether fictional or non-fiction. Um, and the claim of the Bible is that, yes, it is. And, and I think the reason that I think is important to affirm a commitment to the, the Christian scriptures in the light of many other options is because the scriptures themselves are making universal claims. This is one of the things I think Tom's highlighted in his work, that part of the part of what we've inherited in the Judeo-Christian worldview is a sense that the God who made a covenant with Abraham will bless all families through his offspring and that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is the release of that blessing to all nations. And so the work of the Apostle Paul and others is as someone intent on bringing this message of Jesus, the risen Messiah, uh, to the world, not just to to a particular civilization. And, 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 you know, in that sense, Christianity is fundamentally not western in its origins even if it's had a huge footprint in the west um i think therefore it doesn't stand or fall on any embedded culture that it's within i think it stands or falls on and and this is where i would push harder on is there a correspondence fundamentally between if you like the map of the bible 
and the metaphysical realities of life. And, and that's my own conviction, that, that, that there is a correspondence and that it's not just that the map has some really, the, the Bible it isn't just that it has some very powerful ideas and ideals, um, but that it actually corresponds. Give, give, give us one example, just to, to put a bit of meat on that. What, what sort of thing the Bible says maps with the metaphysical reality in a way that isn't just a coincidence in a sense for you? Well, I think going right back to the beginning, if the, the claim right at the beginning of the origin story, which I think is absolutely remarkable, and I've appreciated Dominion um, with this in mind, it's remarkable to say in such an ancient culture that uh, humans, male and female, are made in the image and likeness of God. Now, for me, the question then is, is that simply a social construct? Is that something that, that has arisen as a very a, a way of honouring and, and thinking of dignity and the sacred value of humanity or and without going into the details of which particular theory of creation or evolution you, you you adhere to is there nevertheless some divine being who is superintending the whole process of human origins such that we are actually made in the likeness and image of god and therefore when you model that and affirm that it resonates deeply with the human condition and that human condition is is transcultural so whichever you know whichever nationality or context or historical moment you are born and raised in the human condition hasn't fundamentally changed the map that says we're made in the image and likeness of god corresponds to the landscape of what you see when you hold a child in your arms that's a newborn and what happens when you say goodbye to a loved one for the last time it's it deeply resonates that that's actually that that's actually true, and then at the other end of the story, I think. Um, well, no, yeah, I'll pause there. Sorry, Justin. You oh, well, may, just be interested. Yeah, but we'll, we'll hopefully we'll have time for, the, for for another one. But that's the, an interesting specific there, Tom. Uh, one that you obviously have referenced in in your own work. So, is that? Um, do you see that as a kind of yeah a coherence a mapping on of the story of the Bible to a metaphysical reality? Um, because it, 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 but or is it that that story shaped well, the like way we it. think about? <laughs> yeah, you'd, you'd like, like it to, <laughs> you know, because it's a huge reassurance, isn't it? Um, I mean, it's it it. We're so saturated in that assumption that there is an inherent human dignity that I think we are naturally prone to assume that it must map map onto a kind of metaphysical ob objective truth. And even those who who. Um, you know, I mean, in, in the very name humanist, there's an idea that to be human has a kind of dignity, I, I, even if that is, you know, humanists are rejecting um, the idea that uh, that scripture is is somehow God given or God inspired. Um, but I, I, I mean, I think that um, there is, of course, you know, th this incredible power within the Bible, this assurance that that um, humans do have that dignity, do have that status. Um, but I, I would say that you know that there are other there are other myths and other texts that perhaps um, you know provide a kind of alternative perspective of which the Greek myths would would be for for us in the West the other great cultural influence that actually um, awful things happen and people just go down to the underworld and there isn't really any plan and there isn't really any dignity and the only dignity to be had is to kind of stare down the fact that there isn't any dignity um and that in a way is a kind of crueler more unsettling uh, possibility and i think that um i mean i think it's it's fascinating and i realize that that i've always been haunted by this this kind of uh, symbiosis between the two great mythic accounts in our culture that we have in the West of, of a city being stormed and torched. In, for the Greeks, of course, it's Troy and the portrayals of the Trojan War, you know, not just in Homer, but, but in tragedy, um, counterpointed to the portrayal of the, the sacking of Jerusalem by the Babylonians and everything that follows from that. Uh, and, and there, there is the kind of promise of hope and redemption and perhaps it's not surprising that by and large we want to cling to the hope that there's redemption rather than the fact that it's just dogs eating discarded babies i suppose it's that whole question though of, of yes whether the story is pointing to a metaphysical reality um in a sense 
as you've made, again made the point in many of your, your works, Tom, and writings, the humanists who want their, it just to be a materialist universe and so on, they've they've got their story certainly doesn't come from the science, you know, of the thing that that no, that doesn't no. tell us that we have a human dignity or anything. Right. They're, as far as you can see, they they are not, as fully wedded to the Christian story as as you and I are. Yes. In that sense. Yes. But, 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 because you know you could just as easily end up as a Nazi as a liberal if you if you jettison yeah. you know, if you're just going with the science. I think when Tom um, when Tom references the the sacking of um, Jerusalem as well, I think that's a good instance of the Bible actually uh, capturing a story a narrative that is incredibly difficult. I mean, the theme of exile it arguably runs through the whole Bible because it's the estrangement of our human condition in the world, but Israel experiences it in a very historical moment. And the reason I find that helpful is that actually it's, and this is, this is both hard and helpful, it's actually clearly the prophets understand that this event of exile has been caused by God, even Israel's God, even though outworked through you know, foreign powers. But then it's within that context of exile that, that this amazing verse in Jeremiah that I think is from from my bike with my bible society hat and i think it's becoming one of the most possibly the most popular verse in the bible now that i know the plans i have for you um says the lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you plans to give you hope and a future is written and spoken into the context of defeat exile despair and i i think that's right at the heart of what what we're discussing today actually is is fundamentally is that story a redemptive story, a story of hope. Is that the true story? I mean, one, one, one thought on that. The, the Trojan War, it, I mean, if it ever happened, is, is essentially a myth. We know nothing about really what happened. Um, it, th these are mythical figures. Um, we don't know uh, what happened to the people who fought at Troy. We don't even know if they did fight at Troy. Um, the, the thing about the, um, the, the people from Jerusalem being carried to Babylon um, and then returning and the people who've been left behind staying true to, to, to their God in the face of overwhelming defeat. That is a historical fact. So there was something in the scripture and in the relationship of the people who read that scripture to the God that they found vested in that scripture that did enable the survivors of the Babylonian sack to retain an identity. And that's unique. No other group of, of exiles, including the 10 tribes, of Israel that got taken to, to, to Assyria were able to do that. Um, so that, I mean, that, that, that in itself is a fascinating kind of contrast, I think. Mm. And perhaps mm. again suggests why people by and large have been happier to identify with, with suffering Jerusalem than with suffering Troy. Mm. I'd still say, I totally, I, I, I still, I'd still say, um, even uh, whilst those those examples are helpful, I, th I think the sharp edge of this this issue of does the map correspond to the metaphysical reality? I suppose from a Christian perspective, the sharp edge of that is the resurrection of Jesus. Ultimately, isn't it? That is the 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 point within the story. You, you could, to some degree, you could dispense with all other to a differing degree, dispense with all other. But on that one, there seems to be this. Um, this tethering of the map and the, and the landscape, the historical event and the the story um, that's crucial, and I think that's probably the one where where the decision needs to be made clearest. And, and, and that's a nice that, cliff, cliffhanger. Something else. Can we go to a cliff? Can we go to a cliffhanger, okay, Tom? Because I'm just going to take a quick break. <laughs> On that cliffhanger, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back to see what Tom Holland has to say in response. We're talking about the Bible. Can it make sense of modern life? My guests are Andrew Ollerton and Tom Holland. In the United Kingdom just today, we passed 100,000 people who've been killed by the virus. I'm not the one here who is claiming that this is being supervised, that somebody is watching this, somebody knows that this is occurring and somebody's allowing it to occur. We're in no position to say definitively there is no morally justifiable reason for this particular evil because we need a godlike perspective on all of space and all of time in order to make that claim.
Really enjoying today's discussion, Can the Bible Make Sense of the Modern World? We've ranged quite far and wide, but I've really enjoyed the conversation today between Andrew Ollerton and Tom Holland. Uh, the Bible, the story that makes sense of life, is the book that we've really been talking about. Um, and that's available now. Uh, you can find links to it from today's show. Same with Tom, of course. Some wonderful books. Dominion, which he's been on to have a, a sparky old debate a year or two back now with uh, with AC Grayling on. Uh, but uh, we've also mentioned in the course of the show Revolutionary, a recent uh, uh, collection of essays on Jesus that he edited. Um, but um, uh, and before you go, Tom, I want to hear what you're working on at the moment. But I did leave us on a cliffhanger, um, which is Andrew saying if there's one event that really is at the sharp edge of whether the Bible story is tethered to reality, to metaphysical reality. It is this claim that Jesus rose from the dead. And you wanted to say something in response. So, so go ahead with your thought and we'll, we'll start to draw I, things yes, together. Yes, I did. So in my, in my kind of lazy sceptic phase where the only things I ever read about the Bible were, were kind of deconstructions of it, um, the fact that there are four gospel accounts and they don't necessarily agree. And then you've got Paul's letters and, and he, he barely references the life of Jesus and um, that it all seems a terrible muddle and no one can, can, can entirely agree. And, and that's, you know, is advanced as, as, um, as evidence for something lacking at the heart of, of the New Testament. I, I, I now think that that actually, it's that uncertainty that lies at the heart, the positive message, because basically it's saying something so weird happened, something so odd that we can't really frame it. So we, we, you know, we hear a four accounts of it, um, and they're all different because nobody can actually get a grip on it. And if you look at Paul, I, I, one of the things that most turned me off Christianity was Paul and having to sit as a child and listen to his epistles to the apostles. <laughs> and, you know, oh God, no! When I sat down and I read them, trying to work out what he was saying, and realised that he's thinking aloud, he's he's, he's wrestling with something so bizarre and so odd that that he he's he you know it's it, that language is inadequate to frame the kind of ideas that he's wrestling with and his mind his mind is inadequate to cope with the kind of the drama of what has been revealed to him that makes it incredibly powerful and actually it's it, certainly with the new testament it's it's the uncertainty and the strangeness of it that actually seems to mean to suggest that that these are people who are writing about something that they certainly think is just beyond weird. And it's the weirdness of it. It's the strangeness. It's the inability to merge these kind of different accounts that to me actually shows that that there must be something strange going on there. Strange. Believe a, strange enough to be believable in a sense, I suppose. I, I, and again, I'm asking a personal question here, Tom, but do do you feel like you're at a place where you can say, I'm going to I think there's enough here for me to sort of take that forward, you know, as a fa as a, you know, make a commitment of faith in that to that kind of an idea that you know. Sometimes, uh, I mean, definitely <laughs> Easter, definitely at Christmas, <laughs> definitely at certain times and at certain places, and over the past year with the um, the the attempt to make sense of everything that's happened, um, I you know I found that it's 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 it makes sense in the in the most total the most complete way of any other of any metaphysics right. that I, I can engage with but um and you know i talked to you about this before justin that, that there are always kind of moments where suddenly there's a kind of bucket of cold water comes um and 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 i i guess that um it, it's it's looking at the bible which since that's what we're talking about you know it's it is is it is it um uh is it a rabbit or a duck? Uh, it's it's it can be both simultaneously. And there are times where I look at the the Bible and I think, you know, is this as Origen said, is this a, a great mansion full of many rooms with different keys, and I could find the keys? Wow. Or is this a, a, a compilation of texts that were written by people that have been misinterpreted, that have been stitched together? That, and then I think, yeah, of course, that's what it is. And it's the question of, can I merge those two so that I can keep them both in my brain at the mm. same time? And mm. it's, you know, it's a kind of ongoing thing. So there are times where I can say, yes, I, I mean, I, I, sur I surrender to the power of this. And then there are other times where I think, mm, no. <laughs> so it's a yes and no. It's an interesting, I'm aware that's an it, it, but, answer. I, 
not in the least because in a way i think you've put your finger on sort of where that junction comes between sort of living into something rather than simply looking at it from the outside and and in a way andrew that in a way the whole point of your book is is about stepping into this story right and that's that's often the bit where faith comes in as far as i'm concerned you can you can you can have wonderful apologetics and theology about the bible story and whether it's reliable and 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 everything else and putting it together but i suppose the real challenge is is it the kind of story that you can literally step into and and see yourself as part of of a grand narrative and that's your claim is that you can and you should i suppose in in this book andrew yeah i think that's a fairer summary i think it's almost to use an analogy it's almost like you go to a, if you go to a clothes shop and you know you try something on in their changing room you know you're you're giving it a try you're seeing what you, does this fit me and but there does come a point where you then have to say i like this it fits i'm going to buy it i'm going to buy into it and i think Christianity ultimately still has that um, going to the counter and and buying it, doesn't it? Moment where and it's an act of faith, and and I and I don't think for a moment that precludes doubt. Um, just as Tom was articulating it, but I do think that when you buy into this story, you know, it it just deeply resonates with who we are as human beings. I come back to what I said. I think you know, ordnance surveys sell a lot of maps and do a great job, precisely because they they work for the landscape. They make sense. They help you navigate and. I think the resurrection of Jesus in that sense is less a, a historical fact that has to be coldly proved. And more, um, I, I saw this Easter, actually, the spectator had a f- sort of front cover. Uh, on their front cover, it was sort of a view out of the empty tomb with a, a sort of sunrise breaking. And I just thought it was given all that our world's going through. It was a beautiful visual of capturing the fact that actually the Easter story is fundamentally a story of hope. And we need that. And and so I do believe that Jesus physically rose from death. I've actually grown in my conviction of that through reading Dominion, uh, because I just think that the scale of the transformation that Christianity brought um, almost begs for a, a cause to match the effect. You know, the scale of the effect is so considerable against all of the odds. Um and other failed attempts, you know, Judas of Galilee and others failed attempts to to bring about some kind of messianic, you know, movement indicate that at the point that the body of Jesus of Nazareth was laid in the tomb, Christianity was over. Uh, nothing comes from nothing. And, and it was reduced to to death. And so I just think resurrection is is it. I think it's a metaphysical reality. I think that Jesus rose from death. But I also think that when you see in the course of Christian history and still today, what that hope can do for people, what it does for those who are struggling with illness and sickness that won't go away, what it does for those who are struggling with bereavement. And there's been a lot of that as, as COVID has, has ravaged our world. I just think that hope, uh, exactly as you said, we can try it on and realize that it fits. We're going to leave it there. Thank you so much, both of you. Such an interesting conversation today on the show. There are more conversations to come, especially actually with uh, Tom Holland. Um, You can see him sitting down with N.T. Wright, no less, uh, at this year's Unbelievable Conference uh, to have similar kinds of conversations. We're kind of taking it to the next level. How to, we've agreed in a way, the way that the Bible has, um, you know, impacted the modern world, but can it still? And how do we take that message to a, a new generation? That's really our theme at this year's Unbelievable Conference. So do join myself, Tom Holland, uh, Tom Wright, and other speakers who will be with us there. Unbelievable.live for Saturday, the 15th of May. And you'll both want to watch this as well. Two days beforehand, Andrew and Tom, guess who I've got with N.T. Wright for a special conversation rather like this one? None other than the associate editor of The Spectator, Douglas Murray. So we're going to be getting Douglas and uh, Tom together to talk through these kinds of issues. Identity, Christianity, miracles. I- I'm really looking forward to hosting that one. So uh, so, so that will be a great curtain raiser to the, to, the, uh, to the conference. But for now, Tom and Andrew, thank you so much for being with me. And uh, I'll make sure there are links to both of you from today's show as well, especially that book uh, that we, we've obviously had you on to talk about, Andrew the Bible, a story that makes sense of life. But but for now, thank you both for being with me. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. For more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter.